earlier with another escalation between Israel and Hamas, a new phase of fighting, and for the first time so far, a hostage rescued, apparently. Not freed, but saved, with that Israeli soldier now heading back home to her family. We're going to take you live to the region with the details and what's next in just a second. Plus, the new moves from Russia after a huge mob stormed an airport there when a flight from Israel landed. How it highlights the rise in attacks against Jewish people around the world and right here at home. Then, the former king of crypto hit hard on the stand today in that historic fraud trial against him in New York. Where do you hear what went down in court? And the White House versus the airlines in a new case that could totally change up how you fly. We'll explain why a little bit later on in the show. Hey there, I'm Hallie. And tonight, with the war between Israel and Hamas hitting a new phase, a new development now, another hostage free tonight apparently rescued during a ground operation into Gaza, according to the Israeli military. She's an Israeli soldier, Ori Magadish, now reunited with family. The Israelis say she was taken by Hamas terrorists on October 7th during that brutal surprise attack on Israel. This appears to be the first time, the first time that the Israelis have rescued a hostage. You'll remember four others, like the women you see here, were released, but that was after a period of negotiations, not because of some kind of military operation. All of this is coming as we talk more about military operations generally, because the Israelis are now going after Hamas by air and on the ground in Gaza. You see it here on the right, those tanks and armored bulldozers here. The Israelis say they've hit more than 600 terror targets, as they describe them, over the past few days, with fighting expected to, in their words, intensify. And a densely packed Gaza bombs hitting just a couple hundred feet away from this hospital in Gaza City. Thousands of people have been sheltering here, even with those evacuation orders from Israel, according to a spokesperson for the Palestine Red Crescent Society. People there say they just have nowhere else to go, as the Israeli prime minister late today defends his country's decision to defend itself with these strikes. Calls for a ceasefire are calls for Israel to surrender to Hamas, to surrender to terrorism to surrender to barbarism. That will not happen. More than 8,300 people are believed to have been killed in Gaza, more than 1,400 in Israel since this war started about three weeks ago. Hala Garani is in Tel Aviv. David Noriega is in London for us. Hala, I want to start with you. Can you talk to us about this latest hostage freed? Apparently, she was rescued during some kind of a ground operation. Tell us more about the details there and what it means for the other people, 200 plus, who are still being held by Hamas after being abducted. Well, what we know is she was rescued after an overnight raid by the Israeli military, which has really gotten pretty deep into the Gaza Strip. We understand about two miles, according to some of the video we've been able to see. Ori Megadish is uh, her name. Officials say she's in good health. She showed an image of her there with her family. We saw also video of her greeted by her loved ones. She was an observation soldier uh, posted in uh, Nadal Oz, which is very close to the Gaza border. Uh, she's a private, uh, so uh, really uh, a, 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 a young uh, private, a young recruit in the Israeli military. Uh, they're not telling us exactly why, how she was rescued. Obviously, she's being debriefed right now, one imagines, to try to figure out, for, as far as the Israeli military is concerned, where other hostages might be located. So we don't really have exact details as to how she was rescued or where exactly she was located, Hallie. You know, this all comes as we know that there is that escalation now in some of the attacks that Israel is waging now against Hamas in Gaza after that terror attack a few weeks ago. Mm -hmm. Even as the prime minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, we showed him just a second ago, he's been facing more and more criticism. He went on what used to be Twitter mm -hmm. X and blamed his own military and security officials for being caught so off guard by that surprise attack. He deleted that. He apologized, which is not something he often does. Give us a sense of what the mood is like where you are and where this goes next as this fight intensifies. Look, countrywide, Benjamin Netanyahu is extremely unpopular. That post and that delete was very embarrassing for him. He was blaming his own intelligence services for the failures, and he was forced then to apologize. What he did this evening is he went on television and he uh, rejected any idea of a ceasefire, even though we know mm -hmm. that some of the Israel's closest allies, including the United States and President Biden, are... Um, 
pushing him, putting a little more pressure on him to allow for at least a humanitarian pause to give oxygen to some of the uh, hostage release negotiations and to get more aid in. Uh, but he rejected that. He said essentially that would be a surrender to Hamas. He said he likened the attack of October 7th to the attack on Pearl Harbor in 1941. He likened it to the attacks on the United States on 9-11 as if it would be surrendering to al-Qaeda in 2001. So will this internally, politically, um, uh, you know, allow him to regain some popularity? with his people, I can tell you that based on the polls and anecdotally just based on the people we speak to here in Israel, he is very, very unpopular and many are blaming him directly for what happened on October 7th, Hallie. Hala Garani, we're so glad to have you on the ground there live for us tonight in Israel. And you're right, it is notable, of course, that the prime minister made very clear that no ceasefire would happen here. Thank you, Hala. We know that the Russian president is today calling a meeting with top security and law enforcement officials there, according to the AP, after that mob. That big mob stormed an airport, look at this, in the southern region after a flight from Israel landed there. Hundreds of people. You're seeing some of the videos. Some of them were carrying Palestinian flags. Others held banners with anti-Semitic phrases on them. They swarmed the airport. They rushed onto the tarmac. Sixty people were arrested, according to the Ministry of Internal Affairs. David Noriega is covering this one for us live from London. The Kremlin accused Ukraine, David, of playing a key role, quote unquote, in these protests. Ukraine says, no, that's not the case. But it is one of these examples, right? And we've talked about it before. The intersection of two major global crises here, two international wars, one between Israel and Hamas, the other between Russia and its invasion of Ukraine, the nexus, the collision between these two. Definitely, Holly. I mean, this incident is a really good example of the way that this war has reverberations and real material consequences all over the world, and in which the world's powers can't stay on the sidelines as much as they might want to. So this incident put Putin in a pretty difficult position, not least because he's tried to uh, adopt an ostensibly neutral posture with respect to the Israel-Hamas war, but also because this region where it took place, the Northern Caucasus, is a region with a history of unrest and insurgency. And Putin's credibility depends in part on projecting a sense of security and order in that region. That incident obviously undermines that. Some analysts say that that's why Putin is so intent on deflecting the blame towards outside forces. As you said, he did blame the U.S. and Ukraine. Um, earlier today, National Security Council spokesperson John Kirby was asked to respond to the assertion that the U.S. had something to do with this, and this is what he had to say. It's classic Russian rhetoric, isn't it? The West had nothing to do with this. This is just hate, bigotry, and intimidation, pure and simple. And a good leader, a decent leader, would call it out for what it is. The fact that this is devolved into yet another back and forth between the U.S. and Russia shows the yeah. extent to which this has become a truly global geopolitical conflict. Hallie? I think that's right, David. I think that's exactly it. There's also the question here of what is the environment like, what is the climate like now in Russia for, for example, Jewish people? We know that Putin met with religious leaders just recently to try to send this message that they are religiously tolerant or that he wants this to be a religiously tolerant place. But how does that square, right, with the idea that this just happened now? with Jewish people, you know, inside the Russian borders. Right. Jews in Russia and all over the world truly reacted to this incident with horror. They describe it as an attempted pogrom. The Kremlin responded pretty quickly and made an effort to show that it was responding with force. They arrested 60 people, uh, you know, within a day of the incident happening. They say that the federal government is going to handle those criminal uh, investigations and prosecutions. That doesn't actually mean that uh, Jewish and particularly Israeli citizens in Russia will be reassured, though. Benjamin Netanyahu put out a statement saying that he expected the Russian authorities to safeguard Israeli citizens within a borders. On top of that, actually, the Israeli government um, issued its highest level travel advisory against its citizens, warning them not to travel to the North Caucasus and warning Israelis already there to leave as soon as possible. Hallie? David Noriega, thank you very much for that reporting. Appreciate it. The backdrop to what you just heard David talking about, of course, is the growing concern over the rise in anti-Semitism and violent threats against Jewish people, including here at home, with the ADL now reporting more than 300 attacks targeting Jewish people in this country just in the last few weeks since this war started. You can see on the right side of your screen, that is up something like 400% just compared to this time last year. That concern is especially evident on college campuses with leaders at universities like Cornell now investigating online threats targeting Jewish students. More police presence you're seeing because of that, tighter security on some campuses. Students at Columbia in just the last couple of hours are calling on leaders there to do more. Watch. Please. Do not abandon your students, Columbia. Take action now. How much clearer do we need to be? We do not feel safe. 
safe here? When will our administration get the message? When it's already too late? Our team is also now learning of new plans from the White House to try to fight back against this uptick in anti-Semitism on college campuses. With the government now partnering with some law enforcement at schools to track hate-related rhetoric online. Stephanie Gosk is covering all of this for us live from New York now. And Steph, give me a sense um, of what's going on where yeah. you are. You are at Columbia. We just saw what students are trying to do here. What's it like and where does this go? You know, Holly, there were about 30 to 40 Jewish students who came out here for that press conference, and they were all deeply unsettled. And you heard a little bit there in the, in the sound and what people were saying, that they feel unsafe, unsafe here on campus. And, you know, they laid out a number of incidents that have taken place since Hamas's attack on Israel on October 7th. Among them, uh, an Israeli student that first week was putting up posters of the hostages taken in Israel and was attacked by someone. And then there were... Uh, uh, there was an arrest made and hate crimes charged as a result of that. But the students went on to say that the that the school administration is not doing enough, they think, to keep them safe. Listen to a little bit more of what they had to say. My Jewish sisters and brothers and I are on the receiving end of death threats from our peers. Undergraduates who have filed reports about these incidents have been left with no emotional support, no feedback, and no consequences for the perpetrators of these hateful actions. It's important to point out that Columbia University, uh, in a statement to us today, said that there are resources for people to reach out to. And the president of this university has condemned, certainly, the anti-Semitic attacks um, on campus here, as well as the attack by Hamas on October 7th. All of this happening um, on a day when, not too far from here, at Cornell University, as you mentioned, there was an incident there where the president of the university said that there were threats posted online in what she called a, quote, series of horrendous anti-Semitic messages threatening violence. And they had to get campus police to stand outside of uh, a building for Jewish living. And they also contacted the FBI, Hallie. This has gotten to the point now, Steph, where it is, it is perhaps not surprising. This has reached the level of the president of the White House trying to take steps here. Talk us through what they're doing, what some of these universities are trying to do. So it's coordination and it's an increased presence uh, and, and dialogue between state and local law enforcement and federal, including the Department of Homeland Security and the FBI. I mean, we have had the White House has come out before talking about the rise in anti-Semitic, but also Islamophobia in the country. You obviously have concerns on both sides of that issue. You know, there's another thing to point out, too, from students here at Columbia. We've been trying to get some of the pro-Palestinian groups on this campus to speak to us on camera. One of them actually sent us a statement saying that they were too afraid to show up on camera, that they'd been receiving death threats and that they didn't feel like they, it was comfortable enough for them to do it. That's exactly the kind of thing that the White House wants to combat, Hallie. Stephanie Goss, Steph Live for us there in New York. Thank you very much. That brings us now to Illinois, where a Chicago landlord is pleading not guilty in the deadly stabbing of a six-year-old Palestinian-American boy earlier this month. You probably remember it, of course, the death of that little boy, Wadea, Wadea, excuse me, Al-Fayoume. 71-year-old Joseph Shuba allegedly screamed, you Muslims have to die, when he stabbed that little boy something like 26 times. The boy's mother was also stabbed. The murder charge in the indictment against Shuba says the boy's death was the result of exceptionally brutal or heinous behavior. The landlord's wife told investigators he was an angry man who became obsessed with the war between Hamas and Israel. Maggie Vespa is joining us now. Talk us through this, Maggie, because the prosecution is coming out and basically saying we have a mountain of evidence here. He is pleading right. not guilty. What's happening and where does it go? Yeah, so essentially, Shuba's public defender, who spoke, by the way, for the first time since he was appointed to this case, told reporters after the hearing that his client, the 71-year-old landlord in this case, basically entered a not guilty plea while his defense team conducts their own investigation into this attack. So while that investigation plays out, basically, he's having his client protect his rights and pleading not guilty for the time being. But you're right. I mean, you talked about a little bit of it right there. Prosecutors say they talked to Shuba's wife, for instance, who said, yeah, my husband is a really angry man who told prosecutors that he'd been listening to, in her words, conservative talk radio on a regular basis, and that he had said, prosecutors had said, that he became obsessed, uh, the word they chose, with the uh, Hamas attacks in Israel, became enraged by them, and then convinced that his tenants, this Palestinian-American mother, 
and her six-year-old son were going to hurt him. So a week after the Hamas attacks, that is when authorities say Shuba carried out this hateful, deadly attack in the Chicago suburbs against the little boy, killing him and wounding his mother, Hallie. So again, we have a not guilty plea, um, but that just kind of speaks to where his lawyers say we are in this procedure right now, which, as you know, uh, these kinds of cases can take quite a long time. Yeah, for sure. How is um, how is that mom doing? Um, I know we talked about she was hurt in this attack. What's her status? Yeah, she was stabbed 12 times herself. Mm. Her son was stabbed 26. She was stabbed 12. She was hospitalized, obviously, and somewhat miraculously, she has been now released from the hospital. So she's recovering at home. Uh, and essentially, she's spoken briefly, uh, mostly through written statements, one that came out through the Council of American Islamic Relations. In it, she asked that the public basically pray for peace and then in that statement, it says that she was asked about her son, her six-year-old son, who was killed in this attack, and she simply said, he was my best friend. Hallie? Ugh, it is a gut punch, Maggie. Um, it is a gut punch every time we have to cover that story and so many others. Yeah. Thank you. Let's take you now uh, to court. Wrapping up in just the last 30 minutes or so in the trial of Sam Bankman-Fried, the now disgraced former king of crypto as he got a pretty heated cross-examination from prosecutors today at that historic criminal fraud trial in New York. He was testifying. He was proud of the success of FTX, that crypto company, when he was asked about promoting it on his own social media page. He even tweeted that FTX was fine just hours before its value went from $10 billion to zero. Think about that, $10 billion to zero in a matter of hours. He also admitted to calling some customers dumb mother expletives in conversations, except he didn't say the word expletive. He says he only called some of the shots as CEO. But former company leaders have told the court that it was Sam Bankman Freed, it was SBF who was the mastermind behind the scheme to try to use customer money to pay for everything from investments to a pricey condo in the Bahamas to political donations. Bankman Freed has pleaded not guilty to a whole list of charges, including, you see him here, wire fraud, conspiracy to commit fraud, etc. He's facing more than 100 years of convicted, and he's going to be back on the stand tomorrow. Kate Rooney is joining us now from outside court. She's been covering every second of this. Explosive anyway to see SBF on stand. This was not expected even just a few weeks ago, right? But talk us through what it's like to see him there. It's one thing for him to be questioned by his own attorneys who are tossing him questions that they know how he's going to answer. It's another that the prosecution is coming out here and and sort of trying to paint this portrait of who this person is. Walk us through it. Big time. So, Hallie, big shift today from what we heard from the defense. It was sort of a comfortable back and forth with him and his lawyers. He was concise. He seemed prepared and confident. That tone shifted today when the prosecution, the government side, got up there, started questioning him. The big thing, they were trying to show inconsistencies. So they would show him emails, transcripts from interviews, CNBC interviews, and books even. They got up there at one point, gave him a book that's been written on this entire crypto collapse and said, oh, I need you to turn to page 200 where you said to this to the journalist. So they've got a long paper trail. He's given dozens of interviews since this company collapsed. So there's a lot of paper evidence that they tried to show. Here was what you were saying publicly. Meanwhile, here's what was going on behind the scenes, behind the curtain, and you were not disclosing that to the public. So there was this big juxtaposition and tension between his public persona and what was really going on behind the scenes. He did not answer directly, kind of found ways to question the prosecutor, actually, ask follow-up questions. He got scolded by the judge a couple of times. So it was tense. It was awkward at times. You mentioned the expletives in there. And so it was did not go nearly as well as his defense. Uh, we'll see what happens tomorrow. But that's the big thing, pointing out inconsistencies and challenging his credibility. It almost seems, Kate, from reading, and you're there, right, but from reading the transcripts, from seeing the notes on this, that there is a dichotomy here between, as you point out, the Sam Bankman Freed who's appearing on the stand and the Sam Bankman Freed who is reflected in all of the evidence that the prosecution is bringing forward from a person who is formerly with FTX felt almost to be invincible in some ways to a person who is now facing like these historic criminal fraud charges here. I mean, it is it is pretty stark. Does it feel like that to you or am I overreading it? Yeah. No, you're, you're exactly right, Hallie. And I think back to a year ago, two years ago, where he was really on top of the crypto world. He built this multi-billion dollar empire. Yeah. And the prosecution at one point asked him about his background. He went to MIT. He studied physics. He was seen as the smartest guy in the room who was able to charm investors yeah. and raise billions of dollars. Now he's trying to say that he was naive and didn't know what was going on. So that's that's hard to square, I think, for a lot of people. And we'll see what the jury thinks about it.
Real quick, Kate, um, it, I think timeline-wise, this is set to wrap up, what, in the next week, couple of weeks here, right? Yeah, it could be as soon as Friday. So they're going to wrap up cross-examination tomorrow. We'll get maybe a rebuttal, closing statement. So it could be as soon as Friday, which is faster than we expected. But latest, it sounds like next week. Kate Rooney, live for us in New York. Kate, thank you. So listen, the United Auto Workers Union is getting to a tentative deal with GM today, which means that that historic six-week strike that brought 45,000 workers to the picket lines appears to be on its way out, according to a release from the union. It says the GM deal is kind of the same as the other deals they made with Stellantis and Ford. Remember, those agreements came all in the last few days. With the United Auto Workers saying, and I'm quoting here, they turned record profits into a record contract. So they seem pleased. Why? What did they get out of this? Well, here's what the union says. They got more money, more benefits, moving the top amount, like the top tier, the top wages, to more than $40 an hour, and a 68% raise in starting salaries to more than $28 an hour. We have no comment yet officially from GM at this point. But the car companies have said the strike cost them hundreds of millions of dollars. And that these new agreements could raise the labor costs on each car or truck by something like $850 to $900. Jesse Kirsch is joining us now from a Stellantis plant in Ohio. So here we go. I mean, Jesse, we have been talking about this for not just the six weeks that the strike has been going on, but frankly for months because this was on the horizon even before the strike officially started. Now here we are. In just the span of the last few days, it seems like there was this flurry of activity that wrapped things up. How did we get here and what's the reaction to it from your vantage point? Yeah, and by the way, Hal, you just mentioned uh, no word officially yet from GM. We do have a statement now, so Tell me. I'll just read to you in part. GM says, quote, yeah, look at that, right? Asking you shall receive. GM says in part, quote, GM is pleased to have reached a tentative agreement with the UAW that reflects the contributions of the team while enabling us to continue to invest in our future. So the GM was essentially, uh, if you will, the last domino to fall. You had uh, an agreement between the UAW and Ford last week, then came Stellantis over the weekend, and we were waiting to see what would happen with GM because the union actually expanded its strike against GM over the weekend as well, and then news today of this tentative agreement. We now know that with all three of these deals, the union says that there will be a 25 percent a base wage bump across uh, about four plus years into April of 2028, among other things. We spoke with a worker here at the Stellantis facility earlier about how he feels about this deal. For him, it's welcome news. Here's part of what he shared. This is a life changing um, in a way because, like I said, it helps me and my family get by and not have to worry or struggle or have the stress on top of your head of trying to make do for the month. And uh, it's just great. And how I want to just emphasize the hardship that uh, workers such as that gentleman have been going through. He told me that he has been to get by to feed his family, which includes two young children, a two year old and a four year old. He said he had been buying expired canned food to be able to provide for his family because he was just wow. getting strike pain. Remember, that was just five hundred dollars a week and he'd been on strike for over a month but he thinks it was worth it based on what the union has gotten out of this deal. Yeah, based on some of these numbers that we're able to report here, President Biden, we know, had been asked about this, had been talking about this. He was asked, I mean, throughout the course of this strike, and he was asked, of course, today about this deal. Let me play a little bit of that. They have reached an historic agreement and a hard-fought uh, agreement that was uh, really battled for a while. Ultimately, the final word on this contract will be for the UAW memberships themselves in the days and coming weeks as they vote. Talk about the interplay here between the White House, between the president and his team, with the car companies, with the striking auto workers, because this ran the risk of becoming a major political issue for President Biden if it were to have lasted longer. Yeah, this is, I mean, a really super interesting thing, and it, it's going to go down, I think, as one of uh, the politically challenging things that President Biden has had to work through in office because he has been making a push toward electric vehicles at the same time he likes to tout himself as the most pro-union president. Uh, and when you look at those two things head to head, they kind of butt heads, frankly, because there's concern that a move to EVs could eliminate traditional 
auto worker jobs. Uh, the union appears to have gotten at least some job security protections in that space with these agreements. Uh, and we're still trying to get more of those details. But the president has been trying to navigate that push, which has been something he's encouraged the industry to do, but at the same time trying to support the workers who are concerned about that. And there was a time where the, the union was, was almost in a way challenging the White House or, 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 or lashing yeah. out against the White House. Then suddenly you have the union inviting the president to join the picket line. So it's just a very interesting, uh, you know, internal Democrat, traditionally Democratic politics uh, infighting almost that has led to that united front. And now you've got the president celebrating these deals. And of course, we can't forget that Michigan, where the UAW is headquartered and where a lot of this attention has been, is obviously a, a key swing state when it comes time for a 2024 uh, election. I think we've got one of those around the corner, Hallie. Do we? I, I don't, I can't remember. Um, Jesse Kirsch, thank you very much. <laughs> I really heard, appreciate it. You, <laughs> great work out there these last six weeks, friend. Appreciate you being on. Speaking of what's happening next year, that 2024 election, let's get to some new numbers out tonight, giving us a glimpse at where this may go on the Republican side, specifically in the key early state of Iowa. But this new polling show that most of the former president's supporters at least in that state, are totally sold on him. They are locked in. Nearly two-thirds of Donald Trump supporters in Iowa say their minds are made up, according to these numbers. They say, nope, nothing's going to change our plan to vote for him in January when they go out to caucus. Compare that to the numbers for Ron DeSantis or Nikki Haley, two of the people who are also running in this race, but they are running far behind Donald Trump. He continues to hold that commanding lead. Look at that. You see it there. But the fight for second place and maybe to become kind of a chief rival to Mr. Trump, that is heating up. Nikki Haley is having a little bit of a surge here since August. She is now in an essential tie. You see it there with DeSantis. I want to bring in Shaq Brewster, who is live for us from that all-important state of Iowa. I mean, listen, January 15th, it is honestly not that far away. I know people may not be keyed in and thinking about it now, but, but voters there are, caucus goers there are, because there is so much attention on their state, so many right. candidate visit visits. And these new numbers, I think, paint a very interesting picture of where this is going. Donald Trump has long had a very solid lead in that state and nationally in the Republican primary, but these numbers are showing us Absolutely. just how how strong because his supporters aren't planning to change their mind. So what does this mean for any hope for somebody hoping to come in second? And is it going to matter if Donald Trump romps to a win three months from now? Yeah, you know, that's kind of a question that you hear everyday people asking, like, does anyone else have a chance in this state of Iowa? And when you look at the polls, yes, the top line, you see former President Trump, he has a commanding lead in this state. There's no other real way to put that. But one other way to look at it is that his lead is slimmer and softer than what you see in some national polls. And he, there are still more people, more Republicans who responded to pollsters saying that they are supporting a candidate who is not Donald Trump. Now, the problem for them is that there's not one candidate that they're doing that, that it's support is splintered throughout several candidates. So there's uh, some opportunity there. And, you know, we actually had the opportunity to talk to some of the voters who uh, were part of that poll, who participated in that poll to get a bigger sense and a deeper sense of why they're leaning one way or the other and how they're feeling about things on the ground. Uh, and, you know, one thing that you really heard is that uh, what we saw in that poll of if you support Donald Trump, you are really going to stick with Donald Trump. But those who are considering DeSantis or Nikki Haley, they're open to other candidates. They're watching debates. They're looking at what these candidates have to say. They're still shopping around. And you really get that sense in those conversations, Allie. There's also the other piece of this, right? We talk a lot here, I think, over the course of the last year, and we're going to talk a lot over the course of the next year about the intersection between Donald Trump's political lane and his legal lane, um, because as one of our colleagues likes to say, yeah. it is all one lane now, right? He's got legal issues to think about here, too, including this... this um, thing that is happening in Colorado today. It started in a courtroom in Denver as we speak today. A challenge to his eligibility to be even on the ballot in the state of Colorado at all. Explain that and how much of a threat that could be, um, again, in Colorado or perhaps beyond it to the former president. 
Yeah, essentially what you have here is six Republican and unaffiliated voters being represented by a liberal group uh, suing uh, the state, trying to get Trump off the ballot and citing the 14th Amendment to do so. Let's pull up the text of that amendment. They're pointing specifically to Section 3 of that amendment that essentially says that any office holder, and I have a uh, text here, let me scroll, sorry, any office any, that states no person may hold office if they, quote, engaged in insurrection or rebellion after swearing under oath to support and defend the Constitution. They're obviously making a nod to what you saw on January 6th and the riots at the Capitol then. Now, former President Trump is saying this is nonsense. He's saying it's election interference. His team tried to move it to federal court unsuccessfully. And you're hearing arguments in court saying that this is up to Congress and not for the courts to do. But this is not just happening in Colorado. This is also an argument being made in several other states, including several crucial battleground states, Hallie. Shaq Brewster, live for us there in Des Moines, where Shaq, I think it's a balmy, what, 30 degrees, perhaps? Oh, wait. Oh, he lost. Okay, well, it's cold. Shaq's cold. We're going to move on because he's cold. And the point is, he is not the only one. You saw him there in his hat, in his jacket. Guess what? If you live anywhere from California to Connecticut, that's probably going to be you this week. 80 million people in this country under freeze or frost alerts. That's because, as you're seeing here, that cold front whipping its way across the country. Very, very low temps. Unusually low for this time of year at night. You have... Um, in some spots, dozens of spots, overnight lows that could break records. Colder than it's ever been this time of year. I want to bring in meteorologist Bill Karens. Um, literally Friday, you're on our show talking about unusually high record temperatures. Yes. Now here we are on Monday, unusually low record temperatures. What is happening and like, what does it mean for people who are trying to get their trick or treat on tomorrow? And Hallie, it's also interesting. I don't even remember the last time I talked record low temperatures. You know, with our planet warming and everything, we've been talking about record heat. For it's so rare now to actually have a big cold blast where we actually can set record lows, especially at night. Uh, that's where our temperatures, with the humidity and also because of all the urban sprawl, are just much higher than they've been. So here's where we are now. And of course, we're just seeing Shaq with his hat and gloves on. First NBC reporter of the fall I've seen, by the way, dressed up with hat and gloves. So the temperature in Omaha is at 41. Wind chills 34. For St. Louis is. 43 and 37. So Shaq's right in Iowa here. So yeah, it's chilly. Even with the sun, it feels like in the 30s. So this big cold shot is going all the way to the south into Texas. And this is the end of the growing season. The reason they issue these frost and freeze warnings is to let you and people like me, I still got my cherry tomatoes growing, that you need to go get the rest of them and bring them inside. It's over with. Plants are going to be dead in the morning uh, once they freeze up tonight. Dallas, Little Rock, Tupelo, Nashville, all the way up to areas to the north. And we will break a few records tonight. They'll be close to it, St. Louis and Indianapolis, but the real cold morning is Wednesday morning. Dallas, 31 degrees, and Kansas City down to 20. So, Hallie, it's beginning. Denver had their first snowstorm this past weekend, and uh, I think next week we're probably going to talk about a snowstorm maybe in areas of New England. We'll have more on that in the coming days. Cool. Five minutes of fall, and now we're fully into winter. Bill Karens, <laughs> thank you so much. Appreciate it. Okay. we got a lot more coming up here on the show, including new details of the final hours of Matthew Perry's life, what the Friends star's pickleball coach says about the day he died, plus a whole lot more. And a former NHL player killed in what his team calls a freak accident. What happened on the ice in our five things. Tonight, new details of the last day of Friends superstar Matthew Perry, who, of course, as you already know, died over the weekend at the age of 54 after an apparent drowning. Turns out Perry played pickleball that morning. According to the actor's friend and coach, he liked playing to help with recovery from addiction. In his recent memoir, Perry opened up about his decades-long struggle with alcohol and drug addiction. And he helped others dealing with the same thing, something he said he hopes to be remembered for in an interview last year. If somebody comes up to me and says, I can't stop drinking, can you help me? I can say yes and follow up and do it. When I die, I don't want friends to be the first thing that's mentioned. I want that to be the first thing that's mentioned. Perry was found unresponsive in a jacuzzi in his L.A. home. According to a source familiar with the matter, Perry's assistant was at his house and went to run an errand, coming back to find Perry dead. The cause of death is still unknown, pending toxicology reports, but foul play is not suspected. I want to bring in Dana Griffin now. Tell us more about the investigation and, and importantly here, the way that so many people around the country and around the world are remembering Matthew Perry in the way he wanted to be remembered, right? As a person who was yeah. selfless in looking to help others who were also dealing with demons. Mm. 
Absolutely. Where the investigation stands right now, Hallie, the medical examiner has listed his case as deferred. That means that further investigation needs to be done. That will likely look like blood tests being sent to a lab. That's why it'll take several weeks before we possibly know his exact cause of death. We know from his pickleball instructor that he played pickleball that morning for about an hour. And I'm sure the medical examiner will be looking at what he did that day. He was found allegedly in a jacuzzi. So possibly the, the activity that morning and the jacuzzi, wondering if that will play a role in this investigation. Again, no foul play is suspected. But his death is really hitting fans very hard because a lot of them saw him as their lovable friend. He was so relatable, had just impeccable comedic timing, considered one of the greatest comedians, television comedians of all time. So a lot of people are mourning that loss, showing up to his house here in the Los Angeles area. Also in New York, outside of that New York apartment building, the facade, which we saw in several episodes of Friends, leaving dozens of bouquets of flowers, gathering together we spoke with some people about what his passing means to them listen the show helps people get through tough times you know comedy there's always laughter through through tears but this time there's a little bit more tears through the laughter I think like he really fought to have like a great life and so it's kind of sad that he he made it out on the other side and he passed away a lot of emotion over these last few days. We have yet to hear from the five other friends, but we have received a statement from the co-creators of the show. They write in part, we send all of our love to his family and friends. This truly is the one where our hearts are broken. A homage to the show because the episode started with those words, the one. Hallie. Mm, Dana Griffin, live for us there in L.A. More to come perhaps on that story in the days ahead. Thanks, Dana. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, President Biden today signing an executive order on AI to make AI developers hand the government safety information. The administration is then going to create or try to some safety and security standards for AI. The president says AI is making things change at warp speed and that it has to be regulated to try to avoid some of the risks. Number two, the head of Google testifying today in that huge antitrust trial we've talked about. He says Google paid companies like Apple and Samsung to make sure Google worked well on their devices, not to try to monopolize. The DOJ says Google's been trying to push out competition, but Google says, hey, it dominates because it's the best. Number three, the FDA says people should stop buying and using more than two dozen over-the-counter eye drops sold to places like CVS and Rite Aid and Target. That's because they could cause eye infections that could make people go blind. Caveat, right? We don't know about anybody actually getting hurt from these products yet. That's important to note here. But the FDA says it found unsanitary conditions at the facility that manufactures some of this stuff. Some of the companies are now taking the products off the shelves. Number four, former NHL player Adam Johnson has died as his team, England's Nottingham Panthers, saying it happened after a skate blade slashed his neck during a hockey game. They're calling it a freak accident. He was just 29 years old. Number five, FIFA is banning Luis Rubiales from soccer for three years. Remember, he used to head up the Spanish Soccer Federation. And then he kissed a player on the lips without her consent after the Women's World Cup win by Spain. Rubiales posted online that he is going to try to fight that man. Got a lot more to get to when we come back, including police on Long Island who say a man pointed a gun at a child's head over a Halloween candy mix-up. How in the world that could have happened? Coming up in the local. Plus, an update on a story we've been following. The NBC News interview with the Mississippi mom who found out police killed her son after she'd been searching for him for months. What she wants now from the city of Jackson. Next. We are hearing tonight for the first time in a national on-camera interview from the mother of a Mississippi man. Her son was run over and killed by a police cruiser, but she didn't find out about his death until several months after it happened. Remember, we first told you this story about Dexter Wade here on this show last week. Our team, our John Shuby, reporting that out because police in the city of Jackson say he was hit back in March by one of their cars as Dexter tried to walk across a highway. His mother says she spent months worrying about him. She didn't know that it happened. She didn't know what had happened. She was searching for her son day in and day out, all while his body was just across town in an unmarked pauper's grave. Now, she's telling us how she felt that day, five months after she last saw her son, when police finally told her what happened. Listen. 
Now, you can come tell me my son is dead, but you couldn't come tell me when he died to let me have the opportunity to say bye. Jackson police say this was a very unfortunate case of miscommunication, that there was no bad intent on their part. But the Wade family is also today getting help from, you see him here, well-known civil rights attorney Ben Crump, so they can get Dexter a proper burial and get some answers to their questions. You saw NBC's Blaine Alexander there. She is following this one for us from Jackson, Mississippi. And Blaine, we have been on this story for over a week now since NBC News first reported it out. And now here you are with this other incredibly important piece, which is Dexter's mom, who, who wants what feels kind of like the bare minimum here. She wants a grave for her son in a cemetery with a headstone, right? I mean, talk about having this conversation with her, the, the, the accountability that she's looking for here and, and what they want from Jackson. Well, Hallie, you said it. That's just the bare minimum. She says to know that her son left this earth in that way is heartbreaking enough. But she says all she wants at this point is to be able to give him a proper funeral, to say goodbye, to know for sure what happened to his remains. Because even when I was speaking with her today, she was still, quite frankly, rather skeptical that post number 672 actually holds her son, Dexter Wade. She says, all I know is what police told me, but I don't know the condition that they put him in the ground. You know, she and Ben Crump both made the point. We don't know if they put him in a body bag, if they put him in a box, like whether he was embalmed, just what exactly they will find. So right now they're asking, they're petitioning a court to be able to exhume his body, perform their own private autopsy, and then bury him with a funeral and in a cemetery of her choosing. Here's a little bit of what she told me. Take a look. Dexter, I tried to find you, and I couldn't. I'm sorry, baby. I'm sorry you are here. Now my child is in a grave, decomposed. I still can't sit back. I still can't sit back. And Hallie, that's what she told me when she described that moment after nearly six months of not knowing where he was, actually going to that so-called pauper's grave behind a local jail, seeing the kind of freshly marked uh, dug graves at the end of the road and seeing that plot of dirt where he was buried. She said she broke down, spoke to him over uh, in that place and really just was emotional, as you can understand. Yeah, of course. Um, the case has gotten so much attention since, of course, John's report last week detailing this. The mayor even came out now um, talking about this. And then in just the last hour, Jonathan Shupi, who I mentioned, our colleague, said that um, in this new report, what we've seen from Jackson officials in the way of answering some questions now about its police department. Talk me through where this stands. Well, you know, the Jackson De Police Department has not responded to repeated requests from NBC News for comments. We've not heard from Jackson PD. Uh, we heard from the mayor's office and just kind of a very brief statement, basically saying our fam our thoughts are with Dexter Wade's family, but because of pending litigation, we can't comment. So now Ben Crump and his team are saying, you know what, they want the DOJ to investigate. When I sat down with him a couple of hours ago, he said that they are submitting a written request for the DOJ Civil Rights uh, Division to open an investigation into this thing from start to finish, start starting with the way that Dexter Wade was killed to, of course, the way that all of this was handled, his burial, all of that. And on top of that, of course, they want his body exhumed. They want an autopsy. But they say they really just want to dig into all of this, see exactly what happened. They say they don't trust the local investigation. They don't trust what the mayor said, saying that there was uh, no malicious intent. They say that they want the DOJ, the federal government, to come in and take a look for themselves, Hallie. Blaine Alexander, live for us there in Jackson. We're so glad you're there, Blaine. We'll look for more tonight, of course, on Nightly News with your interview with Betterson Wade. We really, really appreciate you being there. NBC News covers hundreds of stories every day, and because it can be tough to read or watch or listen to them all, our bureau teams have done it for you. This is what they tell us is going down in their regions in a segment we call The Local. Out of our Southern Bureau, the Tampa man accused of killing two people and hurting dozens of others in a shooting early Sunday, in court today for the first time. You see some of the... Footage there from the scene. The 22-year-old is facing second-degree murder charges. Police think the whole thing started from a fight between two groups at a Halloween party. They say they're still looking for at least one other suspect. Out of our Northeast Bureau, police are charging a New York man for allegedly pointing a gun at a six-year-old boy who accidentally left Halloween candy on his door. The boy and his sister thought they were at a friend's house, and when they realized the mix-up, they went back to go get the candy. That's when police say the suspect allegedly opened a door and pointed a gun at the boy's head. He is due in court next month. And out of our Western Bureau, 
bit of a traffic accident at Net Death Valley National Park. Why? Well, a tarantula. That, that's the reason why. Police say a couple was driving their RV when they noticed a tarantula like this one on the road. They hit the brakes to avoid trying to hit the spider. Then a guy on a motorcycle behind them crashed. He was taken to the hospital. No update yet on his condition. Coming up here in the show, anger and desperation in Mexico tonight after deadly Hurricane Otis. Why people there say they are not getting the help they so very much need. Next. To the latest on the devastating scene down in Acapulco, Mexico, after Hurricane Otis. Remember that hurricane that went from basically a tropical storm to a monster practically overnight? with people picking up the pieces after the Cat 5 storm hit. But with no power and with streets flooded, getting help to the people who need it has been incredibly difficult. Here's Guadvenegas. Sleek beachfront hotels in Acapulco now in ruins after Hurricane Otis ravaged the area. We are living in a very difficult situation and help has not arrived. It's the strongest storm ever to make landfall on Mexico's Pacific coast and the popular tourist destination, home to nearly a million people now struggling to recover. The death toll jumping to 45 people, according to the state's governor, with dozens more still missing. Military officials saying dozens of boats sank and still more washed up on the shore. The marina completely devastated. Devastated. We tried to save the boats, but with these winds, we were unable to save any of them. There were big yachts, about 80 feet. They all disappeared. Now, frustration with the government's response growing as residents say they're left to fend for themselves. Many flocking to makeshift shelters, lining up for hours for a chance to get food and water. The government should help us with food. I only see that they are just patrolling. They should bring food and water. Stores looted out of desperation for basic necessities. This woman pleading for help from the international community. We don't have anything anymore. They looted everything. Not all of us looted. We really need help. There's nobody here. The government saying 6,500 soldiers are working to keep the peace and help with the aid. Otis's rapid transition from a tropical storm to a Category 5 hurricane happened in just 12 hours, leaving Acapulco residents with little time to prepare, winds gusting up to 165 miles per hour. The Mexican president detailing that not a single power line remains standing in the affected areas. Helicopters. This morning, telling the country helicopters are being used to bring in new utility poles and get the power running as soon as possible, with the president also announcing a tanker carrying gasoline has arrived to help with the fuel shortage. But that will be just another early step in a long rebuilding process, with the cost of the destruction potentially reaching $15 billion. Just as this community's core tourist season approaches, the Mexican Hotel Association telling the Associated Press 80% of the hotels in the area have been damaged. Guad is joining us now. It's it's horrific to think about this, Guad, and to see the damage here, to think about not a pow not a single power line still standing, right? The airport was damaged too. So for a long time, the only way in and out since this storm hit was by a highway that was still getting fixed because of the damage, right? So where do things stand now with people being able to access not just the road, that highway, but being able to get on a plane if they needed to? Hallie, and this is also because of where it's located. Acapulco is on the coast, surrounded by mountains. So that highway was the only way in and out for a few days. A lot of the tourists initially had to get bussed out. So uh, federal efforts have been on getting that airport repaired, both the terminal and the control tower. Now, as of this morning, uh, the press conference held by the president announced that the repairs have been made. Uh, they have been getting some commercial flights in and out during the day to evacuate a lot of the tourists. So when they say all of them have been evacuated and they expect everything to be back to normal at the airport by Wednesday, even with night flights because they'll have all the power. And just today, they expect six commercial flights. So good news as things go back to normal uh, at the airport, Hallie. Yeah, a bit of a glimmer of hope there. Guadvenegas, thank you very much for that reporting. Still to come here on the show for the first time ever, the DOJ is taking two airlines to court over potential merger. Why they say it could end up costing you more money to fly coming up.
For the first time ever, federal regulators are heading to court to try to stop a merger between two airlines to try to keep the number of airlines from shrinking. You know, there's really only four big companies that dominate the travel market here in this country, American, Delta, Southwest, United. Well, now the Justice Department says a potential merger between JetBlue and Spirit could mean not as many flights flying, not as many options for people, especially people who are looking to save some money. Now, JetBlue says, wait a second, no, no, this merger will actually increase competition because it would create one big national low fare challenger to those dominant big four airlines and create a strong fifth player in the market. A trial is set to start tomorrow in U.S. District Court in Boston. Leslie Josephs is joining us now. Leslie, we're glad to have you here. So walk us through some of the enforcement here. The DOJ has challenged some other airline mergers. I'm thinking of American and U.S. Airways back in 2013. That case was settled before trial. Talk us through the situation here and the differences. Well, some of the differences starting, the Biden Justice Department has been very aggressive on the antitrust front. They have gone after a lot of combinations with mixed results, um, but they are not backing down, especially with airlines. The Biden administration has also been very vocal about everything from fees to, you know, costs to sit with your family with airlines. So it, it does kind of have a, a special place uh, within the administration. They are being aggressive about it. Um, this is a little bit different than U.S. Airways and American a decade ago or even Virgin uh, America. America and Alaska in 2016, uh, you know, this is, Spirit is a budget airline. It's known for sometimes it's single digit or double digit fares. JetBlue is more of a full service carrier. But the JetBlue's argument is that they need to merge with Spirit in order to compete with the big four that uh, control most of the U.S. market, about 80 percent of, of the flights that we fly on. Leslie, let me channel what I think a lot of viewers would be wondering, which is, okay, so what does it mean for me, right? In other words, what does this mean for the money that I pay to try to fly if I don't want to spend a lot? Is it going to be good for customers, bad for customers, or is that what's at question here? Well, JetBlue's argument is that a bigger JetBlue can compete with the airlines that really control a lot of these uh, airports. If you've flown out of Newark or Dallas or Atlanta, you know who is controlling uh, the majority of those, those flights. Um, it does remain to be seen, but, you know, JetBlue is going to be taking out a low-cost airline from the market. You know, this is one that, that does offer rock bottom fares. And is it a little bit of a different market than and product of what JetBlue offers? Um, so, you know, with the, with consolidation there are often, you know, you cut flights that are there are too much. There's too much overlap. Airlines goal is still to make money. Um, so that is going to be an issue going forward. Um, but JetBlue says that this, you know, a bigger JetBlue with spirit combined is going to put more pressure on the big players, the Delta's Americans and United's of the world to lower their fares also. Leslie Josephs, thank you very much. We'll see how that one goes as it starts tomorrow. Appreciate it. Thank you. That does it for us for this hour. We've got more coverage picking up right now. We are coming on the air with yet another escalation between Israel and Hamas, a new phase of fighting, and for the first time so far, a hostage rescued. Apparently not freed, but saved, with that Israeli soldier now heading back to her family. We're going to take you live to the region with the details and what's next in just a second. Plus, the new moves from Russia after a mob stormed an airport there when a flight from Israel landed. How that highlights the rise in attacks against Jewish people around the world and right here at home. Then some new disturbing details into us in literally the last couple of minutes here on a man found dead at a Colorado amusement park. Police saying he was armed with guns and explosives and a tactical vest. We'll explain in a minute. Plus, the new plea from the man accused of stabbing and killing a six-year-old Palestinian-American boy. The charges against him and where that case goes. Plus, the former king of crypto hit hard on the stand in a historic fraud trial against him in New York. Wait to hear what went down during his cross-examination a little bit later on in the show. Hey there, I'm Hallie. And tonight, with the war between Israel and Hamas hitting a new phase, a new development now. Another hostage free tonight, apparently rescued during a ground operation into Gaza, according to the Israeli military. She's an Israeli soldier. You see her here, Ori Magadish, now reunited with family. The Israelis say she was taken. She was kidnapped by Hamas terrorists on October 7th during that brutal surprise attack on Israel. This appears to be the first time that Israel has rescued a hostage. You'll remember that four others, like the two women you see here, were released after negotiations. But again, that was after conversations, negotiations, not through apparently a military operation like this time. And as you talk about military operations, Israelis are escalating theirs. Now going after Hamas by air and on the ground in Gaza. Look on the right side of your screen. Those are some of the tanks and armored bulldozers here. The Israelis say they've hit more than 600 so-called terror targets over the past few days. 
with the fighting expected to, in their words, intensify. And a densely packed Gaza bombs are hitting just a couple hundred feet away from a hospital in Gaza City. This is the aftermath you're looking at. Thousands of people have been sheltering here, despite evacuation orders from Israel, according to a spokesperson for the Palestine Red Crescent Society. But the people there say, hey, listen, they have nowhere else to go. The Israeli prime minister defending late today his country's decision to defend itself with these strikes. Calls for a ceasefire are calls for Israel to surrender to Hamas to surrender to terrorism, to surrender to barbarism. That will not happen. More than 8,300 people are believed to have been killed in Gaza, more than 1,400 in Israel since this war started. Hala Garani is in Tel Aviv for us tonight. David Noriega is in London. Hala, we'll start with you. And what we're hearing now from the prime minister, making very clear that despite international pressure from some quarters, there is not an option for Israel to back off here or to back down. That's even though internally he's facing some criticism for the way that he has responded to that October 7th terror attack. Talk us through the dynamics here for him and this escalating offensive by the Israeli military in this new phase. Right. He's immensely unpopular here in Israel. Many people in recent polling blame him directly for October 7th. He tweeted and then deleted uh, on X a uh, message blaming, essentially throwing under the bus his own security services. He was forced to apologize, something Benjamin Netanyahu is not known to do very often. He has announced over the last few days that there will be no backing down. And in a speech this evening, likened the October 7th attack to Pearl Harbor, to 9-11, saying, would America have signed a ceasefire deal with those who attacked it on those days, those uh, days that changed the course of history? Benjamin Netanyahu essentially saying that signing a deal with Hamas for a ceasefire or agreeing to a ceasefire with Hamas would be a surrender to the terrorist group. And this comes, of course, off the back of that rescue of the uh, IDF private. Her name is Ori Magadesh. It happened during an overnight raid. We don't have details, and this is to be expected, details of exactly how that extraction took place from Gaza. But we do know that the Israeli military has gone quite deeply into the Gaza Strip, some two miles, according to video we've been able to see coming out of the territory. Uh, so so it's going to be interesting to see uh, from their perspective once they debrief her as to whether or not they'll be able to get their hands on more of those hostages inside Gaza, Halley. What about the humanitarian situation inside Gaza? Because the head of the UN's Palestinian Refugee Agency is warning that civil mm -hmm. order in Gaza is breaking down. There's a question now if they can even consider operating here. What's the status? So the status is that 26 trucks came into Gaza today from Egypt, and uh, the Israeli government is issuing statements now on uh, the, uh, the, the vetting that they are performing on these shipments, and this is something new as well. I think they are under a lot of pressure now from the United States in particular and other, other governments uh, in the region to let more humanitarian aid in, because indeed the situation inside the territory is absolutely dire. There were warehouses and food centers of the U.N. Relief Agency that were raided by desperate people who were grabbing what they could, bags of flour, medicine and essentials. And uh, there is a realization, it appears, at the highest levels of the Israeli government that at least from an optics perspective, they, they, they must communicate that they are allowing or at least allowing the vetting of more of those shipments into Gaza, Hali. Hala, before I let you go briefly, any more details on that Israeli soldier who was apparently rescued by fellow members of the military? Do you know how she's doing, where she is, or how this happened? So we saw images of her reuniting with her yeah. family. She was a private. She was stationed at Nadal Oz, which is really basically on the border with Gaza. And she was taken on October 7th, and she's one of several troops. Uh, the fact that she's out, as I mentioned earlier, is going to provide clues, no doubt, uh, to the Israeli military, perhaps as to where others might be located. We know, according to the Israeli authorities, that she's in good health, that she's in good condition, they said. She appears to be uh, doing well based on the photos and the videos that we've seen. Uh, but this is what we know. She's a young woman and she's now out and no doubt a great relief as far as her loved ones are concerned. And many of the other families are praying for similar, a similar reunion with their loved ones, Hallie. 
Yeah, more than 200 others. Hala Garani, thank you very much. Russian President Vladimir Putin today calling a meeting with security and law enforcement officials there, according to the AP, after this scene at an airport in Russia. A mob of people storming this place after a flight from Israel landed. Hundreds of people, some of them carrying Palestinian flags, others holding banners with anti-Semitic things written on them, rushing onto the tarmac. The Ministry of Internal Affairs for the region says 60 people have been arrested. I want to bring in David Noriega. Um, David, we have seen Russia sort of walk the line here, carefully criticizing both Israel and Hamas over this war, coming at a time when we know that the Kremlin is trying to make more moves to show that it is trying to be a global leader here and challenge the West. And in fact, we saw the Kremlin try to blame the West for this specific incident, right, this mob at the airport. That's right, Hallie. Russia is one of a number of large non-Western aligned countries that are trying to position themselves as neutral and potentially important diplomatic actors in this conflict, right? China and Brazil are two other good examples. However, that is now going to be much more difficult for Vladimir, for Vladimir Putin to pull off now that this war has in its own way essentially manifested itself within his own borders. As you said, his response has been largely to uh, deflect blame and deflect attention. In this meeting he had today with high-level government officials, he blamed Ukraine and Western, including U.S. intelligence agencies, for fomenting or inciting this violence on social media. This assertion was put to National Security Council spokesperson John Kirby in a presser earlier today. This was his response. It's classic Russian rhetoric, isn't it? The West had nothing to do with this. This is just hate, bigotry, and intimidation, pure and simple. And a good leader, a decent leader, would call it out for what it is. So the fact that this has devolved into a pretty familiar back and forth between the U.S. and Russia just shows how much Russia has not actually been able to stay above the fray in this conflict. Hallie? Real quick, David, um, we know the flights from Tel Aviv ha had been redirected, we heard, to other cities outside southern Russia. Are they, is that still happening? Is that still the case? That is still the latest from okay. Russia's aviation regulator. Yes, they're diverting flights from Israel to other cities in Russia. David Noriega, thank you very much for that. The backdrop to what you just heard from David, of course, is the growing concern over the rise in anti-Semitism and violent threats against Jewish people, not just overseas, but in this country. But here at home, the ADL now reporting more than 300 attacks targeting Jewish people in America since the war between Israel and Hamas started just a few weeks ago. You can see it's up something like 400 percent to this time compared to this time last year. There's a, really a concern growing on college campuses. Leaders at universities like Cornell now investigating online threats targeting Jewish students. That's, of course, leading to more of a police presence, tighter security on some campuses. Students at Columbia just late today are calling on leaders to do more. Listen. Please do not abandon your students, Columbia. Take action now. How much clearer do we need to be? We do not feel safe here. When will our administration get the message? When it's already too late? We are just learning of new plans from the White House now to try to fight against the uptick in anti-Semitism at college campuses, with the administration now partnering with law enforcement at schools to track hate-related rhetoric online. Let's bring in Stephanie Gosk in New York City. Steph, give me a sense um, of what's going on where yeah. you are. You are at Columbia. We just saw what students are trying to do here. What's it like and where does this go? You know, Hallie, there were about 30 to 40 Jewish students who came out here for that press conference, and they were all deeply unsettled. And you heard a little bit there in the, in the sound and what people were saying, that they feel unsafe, unsafe here on campus. And, you know, they laid out a number of incidents that have taken place since Hamas's attack on Israel on October 7th. Among them, uh, an Israeli student that first week was putting up posters of the hostages taken in Israel and was attacked by someone. And then there were... Uh, there was an arrest made and hate crimes charged as a result of that. But the students went on to say that the, that the school administration is not doing enough, they think, to keep them safe. Listen to a little bit more of what they had to say. My Jewish sisters and brothers and I are on the receiving end of death threats from our peers. Undergraduates who have filed reports about these incidents have been left with no emotional support, no feedback, and no consequences for the perpetrators of these hateful actions. 
It's important to point out that Columbia University, uh, in a statement to us today, said that there are resources for people to reach out to. And the president of this university has condemned, certainly, the anti-Semitic attacks um, on campus here, as well as the attack by Hamas on October 7th. All of this happening um, on a day when, not too far from here, at Cornell University, as you mentioned, there was an incident there where the president of the university said that there were threats posted online in what she called a, quote, series of horrendous anti-Semitic messages threatening violence. And they had to get campus police to stand outside of a building for Jewish living. And they also contacted the FBI, Hallie. This has gotten to the point now, Steph, where it is it is perhaps not surprising. This has reached the level of the president of the White House trying to take steps here. Talk us through what they're doing, what some of these universities are trying to do. So it's coordination, and it's an increased presence uh, and, and dialogue between state and local law enforcement and federal, including the Department of Homeland Security and the FBI. I mean, we have had the White House has come out before talking about the rise in anti-Semitic, but also Islamophobia in the country. You obviously have concerns on both sides of that issue. You know, there's another thing to point out, too, from students here at Columbia. We've been trying to get some of the pro-Palestinian groups on this campus to speak to us on camera. One of them actually sent us a statement saying that they were too afraid to show up on camera, that they'd been receiving death threats and that they didn't feel like they, it was comfortable enough for them to do it. That's exactly the kind of thing that the White House wants to combat, Hallie. Stephanie Goss, Steph Lafers there in New York. Thank you very much. We're going to have more, too, on the rise in anti-Semitism in this country as we're just learning about somebody arrested for making threats against a sitting senator coming up in just a couple of minutes. But first, to Illinois now, where a suburban Chicago landlord is pleading not guilty in the deadly stabbing of a six-year-old Palestinian-American boy earlier this month. If you remember the story, I'm sure we told you about him. Wadia Alfayume was stabbed 26 times, with 71-year-old Joseph Shuba allegedly screaming, you Muslims have to die. The boy's mother was also stabbed multiple times in the attack. The murder charge in the indictment against Shuba says the boy's death was the result of what they describe as exceptionally brutal or heinous behavior. Shuba's wife told investigators he was an angry man, according to the documents, and became obsessed with the war between Hamas and Israel. Maggie Vespa is joining us now. Maggie, um, the details of this have been horrific since the second we learned about Wad Wadia's death. They remain right. horrific as we're learning more, of course, from prosecutors here who are pointing to essentially a mountain of evidence that they say they have against Shuba. Um, tell me a little bit more about what we're hearing from prosecutors and from Shuba's attorney, who I understand we just heard from, right? We did. For the first time, basically, since this happened, since he, those charges were filed, and since this public defender was appointed to Shuba's case, he spoke today after the 71-year-old landlord filed his not guilty plea. First, I just want to lay out, just speaking to the seriousness of the, of the charges in this case, you can see the list that we have here. We're talking about first-degree murder, hate crime charges, aggravated battery with a deadly weapon, a total of eight felony counts filed against this suburban Chicago landlord, who today pleaded not guilty after that hearing, after that plea was entered, his public defender told reporters why, despite the mountain of evidence, they entered that plea. Take a listen. We're in the process of conducting our own investigation. As you know, uh, our client is presumed to be not guilty of all charges, and we are going to do the best we can to protect all his constitutional rights, make sure that he receives a fair trial by an impartial jury. Yeah, so basically his defense team doing what a defense team does um, in any scenario, including uh, this one. But again, we just want to reiterate prosecutors telling uh, in, in the first court appearance, uh, telling the judge, telling anybody who was listening, including several reporters in the courtroom that they had spoken to, for instance, Shuba's wife, uh, that she had told prosecutors that her husband was, in her words, an angry man who had become obsessed with the war in Israel, with the Hamas attacks, and therefore fearful of his Palestinian-American clients. Uh, and then we also heard that Wadia's mother, who was wounded in this attack, told police unequivocally, she said, I know who did this. I know who attacked me. I know who killed my son. It is our landlord. I saw him do it. I saw him enter in a fit of rage. So prosecutors saying that there's no doubt in their mind that they have the right person. And yet this is where we are in this case. And again, Hallie, as you know, these cases can take quite some time. So that's where the defense yeah. team is beginning their case at this point. Maggie Vespa, live first with the latest there. Maggie, thank you so much. 
court now. It's in another courtroom in New York, wrapping up in just the last hour and a half or so in the trial of Sam Bankman Freed, the former king of crypto. After a pretty heated cross-examination from prosecutors today at that historic criminal fraud trial, with SBF, as he's known, testifying that he was proud of the success of the company when he was asked about promoting it on his own social media pages, even tweeting that FTX was fine just hours before its value went from $10 billion down to zero, right before its plunge. Sam bankman fried also admitted to calling some customers dumb mother expletives in conversations and says he only called some of the shots as CEO. But former company leaders have told the court that it was SBF who was the mastermind behind the scheme to use customer money to pay for things like investments into a pricey condo in the Bahamas. bankman fried has pleaded not guilty to a whole list of charges, including wire fraud and conspiracy. He's facing more than 100 years if he's convicted, and he's expected to be back on the stand tomorrow. Kate Rooney is joining us now live from outside court. It's been interesting to see, Kate, the prosecution essentially using SBF's own words against him, right? Because they're pointing to things he said that are very different than what he is saying now. In other words, SBF pre the fall of FTX sounds a lot different than SBF post. Definitely two stories there, Hallie. And this is such a unique case because in the, the past year, since this company went bankrupt, so much ink has spilled about this, and he has given so many interviews, and that's what the prosecution used today. They went back to print interviews that he did. They referenced a CNBC interview that he did before the bankruptcy, where he said that there were no conflicts of interest. I spoke to him at the time, and he said these two companies that he ran, that there were there's no overlap, no conflicts of interest. That flies in the face of what we have heard in the past four or five weeks or so with this trial. And there's a lot of other journalists who spoke to him there was even there's been multiple books written but at one point the prosecution handed him a copy of a book in which he's quoted there are direct interviews with him and asked him to flip to certain pages to point out things that he said and he instead of just saying oh well yes of course i gave that interview he would say things like i don't remember saying that despite multiple articles being laid out they talked about his time speaking in front of congress even the, the fact that he spoke under oath and then his tweets they kept coming back to the tweets where he was saying everything's fine, but behind the scenes, they had some evidence and sort of this Google metadata that showed that he had actually seen certain spreadsheets that showed that that was not the case, that they were missing billions of dollars. So really conflicting stories here, and it's very much his word versus some of the evidence we've seen, and then testimony from some of his other top executives that we've also gotten that contradicts again what he's saying on the stand. And I know, Kate, that we're not going to know the answer to this, as you have watched like every minute of this thing unfold. We're not going to know the answer to this until after the verdict comes down. But it is just extraordinary to see Sam Bankman fried take the stand at all, right? Because there was a time and a day yeah. when it was considered uber risky to have a defendant take the stand like this because of what we're seeing now, right? Because of the ability for prosecutors to come in and ask questions that could be pointed and uncomfortable and potentially damaging. And this is the downside that people have been talking about, this gamble that he was taking by testifying in the first place. This is the moment, and these are the moments where he's got to face the prosecution. Danny Savala has made a great point that you see these white-collar criminals and often will take the stand because they are so used to charming investors, charming the media, and think that they can sort of explain their way out of it. They can talk themselves out of it. They think, if I just get up there and tell the jury, they'll get it, they'll get it. And they, they're used to being able to convince people of their side of the story. That is a very different scenario when you're up on the stand and you're under oath. And so he was saying, I've got to get, give credit to Danny there because he was laid that, that out so well. But that is <laughs> some of the psychology behind why they testify. I, again, defendants usually don't. But white-collar criminals do, according to Danny. He just that he laid that out beautifully. But it's, it's a fascinating, fascinating case so far. And more to come, for sure. Kate Rooney, we're glad to have you. Thank you for being on the show. The United Auto Workers Union getting to a tentative deal with GM today. A big deal because it effectively ends that six-week strike that brought more than 45,000 people to the picket lines. Now, this deal is according to both the union and GM. That's what we've learned in just the last hour or so. The union says the GM deal is pretty much the same as the deals they made with Stellantis and Ford. Those agreements, right, the, the big three Detroit car makers, those agreements coming all in the last few days. With the United Auto Workers Group saying they turned record profits into a record contract. GM also saying they're pleased with the deal. They look forward to seeing everybody back at work, work rather. So... 
What is in it, right? What is this deal worth? Here's what the union says they got in all three deals. More money and more benefits with the top wages now, the top pay at more than $40 an hour. Base pay, starting salaries up 68% to just over $28 an hour. The car companies have said the strike has cost them hundreds of millions of dollars and that the new agreements would raise labor costs on each car by $850 to $900. Jesse Kirsch is joining us now. So, Jesse, how do we get here? GM was essentially, uh, if you will, the last domino to fall. You had uh, an agreement between the UAW and Ford last week, then came Stellantis over the weekend, and we were waiting to see what would happen with GM because the union actually expanded its strike against GM over the weekend as well, and then news today of this tentative agreement. We now know that with all three of these deals, the union says that there will be a 25% a base wage bump across uh, about four plus years into April of 2028, among other things. We spoke with a worker here at the Stellantis facility earlier about how he feels about this deal. For him, it's welcome news. Here's part of what he shared. This is a life changing um, in a way because, like I said, it helps me and my family get by and not have to worry or struggle or have the stress on top of your head of trying to make do for the month. And uh, it's just great. And how I want to just emphasize the hardship that uh, workers such as that gentleman have been going through. He told me that he has been to get by to feed his family, which includes two young children, a two year old and a four year old. He said he had been buying expired canned food to be able to provide for his family because he was just wow. getting strike pain. Remember, that was just five hundred dollars a week and he'd been on strike for over a month but he thinks it was worth it based on what the union has gotten out of this deal. Yeah, based on some of these numbers that we're able to report here, President Biden, we know, had been asked about this, had been talking about this. He was asked, I mean, throughout the course of this strike, and he was asked, of course, today about this deal. Let me play a little bit of that. They have reached an historic agreement and a hard-fought uh, agreement that was uh, really battled for a while. Ultimately, the final word on this contract will be for the UAW memberships themselves in the days and coming weeks as they vote. Talk about the interplay here between the White House, between the president and his team, with the car companies, with the striking auto workers, because this ran the risk of becoming a major political issue for President Biden if it were to have lasted longer. Yeah, this is, I mean, a really super interesting thing, and it, it's going to go down, I think, as one of uh, the politically challenging things that President Biden has had to work through in office because he has been making a push toward electric vehicles. At the same time, he likes to tout himself as the most pro-union president. Uh, and when you look at those two things head to head, they kind of butt heads, frankly, because there's concern that a move to EVs could eliminate traditional auto worker jobs. Uh, the union appears to have gotten at least some job security protections in that space with these agreements. Uh, and we're still trying to get more of those details. But the president has been trying to navigate that push, which has been some Something he's encouraged the industry to do, but at the same time trying to support the workers who are concerned about that. And there was a time where the, the union was was almost, in a way, challenging the White House or, 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 or lashing yeah. out against the White House. Then suddenly you have the union inviting the president to join the picket line. So it's just a very interesting, uh, you know, internal Democrat, traditionally Democratic politics uh, infighting almost that has led to that united front. And now you've got the president celebrating these deals. And of course, we can't forget that Michigan, where the UAW is headquartered and where a lot of this attention has been, is obviously a, a key swing state when it comes time for a 2024 uh, election. I think we've got one of those around the corner, Hallie. Do we? I, I don't. I can't remember. Um, Jesse Kirk, thank you very much. <laughs> I heard, really appreciate it. You, <laughs> great work out there these last six weeks, Ryan. Appreciate you being on. So, yes, there is, as Jesse says, an election right around the corner. And with it comes some new NBC News polling tonight that's illuminating where things stand in the all-important early state of Iowa. It shows most of former President Trump's supporters, at least there, are sold on him. They are locked in. They are psyched to get out there and caucus for him. Nearly two-thirds of those supporters for Donald Trump say their minds are made up. Nothing's going to change them. Compare that to the flexibility of supporters of Ron DeSantis or Nikki Haley, who are running just in second place there in this poll. Second place tied, which is interesting, kind of a surge for Nikki Haley. Although, listen, again, right at the top, it is still Donald Trump who is just stomping the rest of the field. It is a commanding lead at this point. I want to bring in NBC Shaq Brewster, who is live with us now from the great state of Iowa, from Des Moines. Um, 
It's soon, right? I mean, like, relative to the political sphere, like, Iowa's coming up fairly quickly here. We've got a mm -hmm. debate next week, and then we're just two months to Iowa and the race for that state here, which can often set the tone for a candidate here. What's interesting to me is not just that this poll reiterates what we have seen in so many other polls, which is Donald Trump very comfortably ahead of the rest of the pack, but also that his right. supporters do not seem likely at all to change their minds here, Shaq. That's right, Hallie. And, you know, the feeling on the ground is pretty similar, that Donald Trump has a commanding lead here in the state of Iowa. So it's leading people to ask, is there a real competitive fight? There, we know there's a competitive fight for that second spot, but how much of a chance do they have? And, you know, one thing our poll did do was ask about the second choice of these Republican voters, these likely Republican voters. And when you see those numbers, you see it turns out to be a little bit more competitive. Now, it's important to note this is not how the election takes place. You choose one person, even though it is a caucus system. But you see, DeSantis takes the uh, hair of a lead there with 68% when you combine first and second choices. And what that does is for people on the ground, that at least gives DeSantis and his supporters some sense of hope. It gives some of those other candidates some sense of hope that they can make this competitive in a state like Iowa, where people are going to be plugged in, they're going to be listening to the candidates, and they're known for choosing under dogs in this state. So listen to some of the conversations I've had and we've had with uh, folks who participated in this poll about how they're feeling about things here on the ground. As much I'm as I hate to say this, I'm afraid I don't want to jinx it. <laughs> I really think Trump will win it. What's going to happen after Iowa and when we go on to other states. And so I um, honestly, I, I probably think Trump's got a pretty good upper hand. Um, but like I said, I'm rooting for Ron DeSantis. And, you know, in our conversations, that enthusiasm and that certainty, we also felt that those who said they were with Donald Trump are with Donald Trump. They are very clear about that. Those who are looking at other candidates, they say there's plenty of time for them to be persuaded, Hallie. Shaq Brewster live for us there in Des Moines. Shaq, thank you very much. Let's take you out west now to Colorado because we are just learning from police that the body of a man was found at an amusement park with the sheriff's department saying he had an AR style rifle, a handgun, explosives and a tactical vest on him. His death now being investigated as an apparent suicide. I want to get right to Tom Costello for more on this. What else do we know about given everything that this person had with him? What what may have been in the works here? They fear that it could have been very, very bad, but they don't know what was in the works. This happened in Glenwood Springs, Colorado, about 40 miles or so from Aspen. If you go out from Denver on I-70, 250 miles or so west. Bottom line here is that the park employees on Saturday morning, they were getting ready to open, and they found this man in the ladies' room. He was dead on the floor, surrounded by weapons, and he was wearing a tactical vest and black, uh, black SWAT team-like apparel. And he had semi-automatic weapons, real and fake. He had also explosive devices, real and fake. Uh, he also had his, his outfit seemed to be covered in emblems, almost like he was a police wannabe. They really don't know. The bottom line, 20 years old, as you see, wearing a helmet, tactical gear, and what have you. Uh, and they are now looking for answers. He, they don't think that this, he had any known criminal history whatsoever. He lived in a nearby house with his mom and his brother, and they are really stumped trying to get answers. But he had allegedly scrawled on the stall of the women's restroom, he had scrawled, I am not a killer before then taking his life. They are on the assumption right now that he did have something planned that would have resulted mm -hmm. in potentially mass casualties, maybe that day, Saturday, when they opened up the park. But thankfully, that didn't happen. He took his own life, according to the sheriff of Garfield County. They then spent two days calling in the FBI and a nearby bomb squad from Grand Junction, Colorado, to, to search the entire area, the entire park, looking for more weapons and bombs, potentially real and fake, his car, his house, they didn't find anything. They found no suicide note. So they're really stumped by this, and they're very grateful that it didn't turn out worse than it did. And also they note that it was within 12 hours or so of the main mass shooting suspect killing himself, apparently, in Maine, that this suspect in Colorado was found dead in the ladies' room inside this adventure park. Hallie? Tom Costello, uh, just some chilling details there. Thank you very much for bringing us that late-breaking news tonight here on the show. Thank you, Tom.
We've got some more breaking news into us, just new details on that Nevada man arrested for making anti-Semitic threats against a U.S. senator. Plus, what we are just hearing in the last couple of minutes from the cast of Friends about the death of Matthew Perry. And a new warning from the FDA tonight for parents, why the agency says a certain type of children's food could have dangerous levels of lead. And you might have a harder time getting your prescription filled. We'll tell you what's happening at pharmacies across the country in our five things. Some breaking news just into us now with the Justice Department saying they've arrested and charged somebody for making anti-Semitic threats against a sitting senator in his home state of Nevada, as we are just now confirming from Senator Jackie Rosen's office that it was, in fact, her, John Anthony Miller, arrested apparently on Thursday on one count of threatening a federal official with court documents laying out a series of disturbing voicemails he left at her office, including one that refers to finishing, I'm quoting here, what Hitler started. NBC's Saho Kapoor is joining us now. It is awful, the threats that were made to Senator Rosen, who is, um, I believe, only the third female Jewish senator to serve in Congress right now. What else do we know about these allegations here? What else do you know about what we're hearing from Senator Rosen, who I understand our team just caught up with in the hallways? That's right, Hallie. We know this man is 43 years old. He was arrested on October 26th. He made his initial court appearance the following day on October 27th. He, he left multiple threatening voicemails uh, this month, according to the Justice Department. They were of a menacing and anti-Semitic nature, according to court documents. Uh, he was uh, arrested on threatening to assault, kidnap, or murder the United States senator with intent to impede, intimidate, or interfere uh, with their uh, uh, official duties. Now, Senator Jackie Rosen spoke just moments ago to our colleague Frank Thorpe, uh, confirmed that it was indeed her uh, who was the recipient of this. And uh, by the way, the Justice Department didn't name her, but she is confirming to us that it was her. She said, quote, we have to always take the threat seriously. She went on to say she has full faith in the Justice Department that they'll take care of the situation and noted that she only saw the indictment herself today for the first time. She added that this is what Jews all around the world are facing uh, in light of recent events the escalating situation in the in the Middle East. Now, uh, a, a few things about Senator Rosen that might, you know, shed light on why she was targeted in this manner. She served as the president of Nevada's largest synagogue before getting elected senator. She's the third female Jewish senator in American history, the co-founder and co-chair of a uh, bipartisan task force for combating anti-Semitism. That is the name of the group, as well as the Abraham Accords Caucus in the Senate. Hallie? Sahil Kapoor, live first there on Capitol Hill. Sahil, thank you. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, President Biden today putting in place an executive order on AI to make developers hand the government safety information so that the administration can create some more security protocols, some security standards around AI. President Biden says AI is making things change at warp speed and that we have to regulate it to avoid its risks. Number two, Google CEO is testifying today in that huge antitrust trial. Pretty significant testimony given his role, of course. He says Google paid companies like Apple and Samsung to make sure Google worked well on their devices, not to monopolize. The DOJ says Google's been trying to push out competition, but Google says it only dominates because it's the best. Number three, today some CVS and Walgreens pharmacy workers are walking off the job over things like not getting paid enough, not having enough staff at stores. The organizers are calling it Pharmageddon. It's their third strike by pharmacists in just about a month, with this particular walkout set to last three days. Number four, the FDA says not to give kids Wanabana apple cinnamon fruit puree pouches because they may have dangerous levels of lead. Health officials say four kids in North Carolina ended up having some higher levels of lead in their blood linked to these pouches. Wanabana recalled the products. Lead it can be toxic to everybody, but can be especially harmful to kids. The FDA says any kid who ate this should get tested. Number five, police say the University of Colorado football team reported that some jewelry was stolen from a dressing room this weekend. It apparently happened during their game against UCLA at the, UCLA at the Rose Bowl. The University of Colorado says it's in touch with both UCLA and police. A spokesperson for the school and for the arena says they're cooperating with investigators. Just into us now, the core cast of the sitcom Friends, for the first time now, speaking publicly to remember the life and legacy of their co-star, Matthew Perry, who a lot of people knew as Chandler Bing. He died over the weekend at the age of 54 after an apparent drowning. These cast members, the other five in the ensemble, say in a statement, we were more than just castmates. We are a family. 
I want to bring in Dana Griffin now. And Dana, this is something um, that I think a lot of people have been looking to, the people who were closest with Matthew Perry during this just incredibly important time um, in his life, in his career, talking about this moment and how difficult this is for them right now, understandably. Yeah. Yeah, very understandable, and that's probably why it took a couple days for them to even make a statement. Uh, but this statement is joint, and I, and I can read it to you. It comes from Jennifer Aniston, Courtney Cox, Lisa Kudrow, Matt LeBlanc, and David Schwimmer. They write, we are all so utterly devastated by the loss of Matthew. We were more than just castmates. We are a family. There is so much to say, but right now we're going to take a moment to grieve and process this unfathomable loss. In time, we will say more, and as when we are able. For now, our thoughts and our love are with Maddie's family, his friends, and everyone who loved him around the world. And it just goes to show, you know, this is a t this is a tough moment for everyone, including those six friends, now the, the, the remaining five friends, castmates. We know that they've talked openly about just how close they are. Whenever they run into each other, say they're at a party, they leave everyone aside and they spend the rest of the night with whoever they are with. They talked a lot about what their relationship was like during that re friend's reunion. And I think for them, they're hopefully they're together. If not, they've been probably on the phone together. There's still a lot of unanswered questions about what happened to Matthew Perry. We know that the medical examiner has listed his case as deferred, which means more investigation will be done before they make a determination for his cause of death. He was found around 4.07 p.m. on Saturday by his assistant. His assistant ultimately called 911. We know earlier that day he played pickleball for about an hour. And again, Matthew Perry will be greatly missed. Hallie. By so many people, including, of course, those former castmates. Dana Griffin, thank you very much. Live for us from L.A. with that developing news tonight. When we come back, some more new details after a train crash in India killed at least 14 people. What happened here, as you can see, this devastating scene. Plus, for the first time, we are now hearing from a Mississippi mom who says police kept her son's death a secret for months. That NBC News interview next. We are hearing tonight for the first time in a national on-camera interview from the mother of a Mississippi man whose son was run over and killed by a police cruiser. She didn't find out about his death until several months after it happened. You may remember this story. We first told you about it last week here on this show. The story of Dexter Wade. As our team, including John Shoopy, reported out what happened from extensive interviews and documentation here. Police in the city of Jackson say Wade was hit back in March by one of their cars as Dexter tried to walk across a highway. His mother says she didn't know that. She had no idea that's what happened. She thought her son had disappeared, so she spent months looking for him every day, all while his body was just across town in this unmarked pauper's grave. Now, she's talking to us about how she felt that day, five months after she last saw her son, when police told her what happened. Listen. Now, you can come tell me my son is dead, but you couldn't come tell me when he died to let me have the opportunity to say bye. Jackson police say this was an unfortunate case of miscommunication and that there was no bad intent on their part. But the Wade family is also today getting help from, you see him here, well-known civil rights attorney Ben Crump. They want to give Dexter a proper burial and they want to get some answers to their questions about his death. NBC's Blaine Alexander, you saw her in that interview. She sat down with, of course, Wade and Crump today in Jackson, Mississippi. It feels like Dexter's mom just wants what, what is, in essence, the bare minimum here, a, a grave in a cemetery with a headstone for her child. Yeah, Hallie, just a place she can go visit. She told me a place where she can go lay flowers, tell him how much she misses him, and just quite frankly know that he's safe. That's what she says she's looking for. So they said today that they're starting that process. They filed a petition with the court to exhume his body, to perform their own private autopsy, and then give him a proper funeral and a proper burial. But she tells me it really was this kind of double punch. One, to find out, of course, that she had lost her son in this tragic way. But then two, when she found out where he was buried, she took me back to that moment where she got out of the car after this long drive in the back of an area behind the local jail and found her son's grave. Take a look. 
next day I tried to find you and I could. I'm sorry, baby. I'm sorry you are here. Now my child is in a grade decomposed. I still can't sit back. I still can't sit back. So that's what she said that she was saying to her son when she was there over his unmarked grave. You saw it. There was only just a number there. But here's yeah. what's so terrible about it, Hallie. She told me she can't even be confident that her son is actually in that grave. She says she's only telling me what police told her, but she doesn't have any records. She really doesn't know whether they put his body in a box, whether it was embalmed, what they will find when they exhume that body, Hallie. Blaine, it was, as you know, our colleague John's reporting, John Shupi, that brought this story to light initially last week and in the days since. That there's obviously been a big spotlight on it, considering just the details of what have happened here, as you've laid out. Um, initially, there was not much of a response from Jackson officials. Has that changed in the last five days? Well, we did hear from the mayor after that NBC News story came out and exposed this entire thing. The mayor basically said their hearts, of course, are with the family, but he doesn't believe that there was any sort of ill intent, any malicious intent. But uh, Wade and Attorney Ben Crump say they don't trust local officials. That's why they're calling on the DOJ, the Civil Rights Division, to come in and investigate this thing from start to finish because they say that they want an outside body, a federal body, to come in and take a look at, see exactly what happened here. Blaine Alexander, live for us in Jackson, Mississippi. Blaine, thank you. We'll look for more of your reporting, of course, in the days to come. NBC News covers hundreds of international stories every day, and because it can be tough to read or watch or listen to them all, our international teams have done it for you. Here are some of what they're watching in a segment we call The Global. Out of India, at least 14 people have been killed, dozens of others hurt after what you see here, this terrible train crash. One train slamming into another train that had been stopped, at least a couple of cars derailed. Investigators say it was probably... Human error, as they call it, which led to the accident. That's just months after another big rail crash in India killed nearly 300 people. Out of Japan, the U.S. is bulk buying Japanese seafood for its military. Why? To try to offset China's ban of those products. That started a few months ago when Tokyo started releasing treated water from the Fukushima nuclear plant into the ocean. Remember, we told you about that and the controversy there. China says it has food safety concerns, but the U.N. says the water is safe. And out of Argentina, something like a thousand people coming together over the weekend to try to break a world record. Are you looking at the screen? Can you tell what the world record was? The most number of spider men and women, spider people, <laughs> at just one event. Um, they're waiting to hear back from Guinness World Records to see if they broke the previous record set in Malaysia back in June. That's a lot of spider folk that have gathered. So all those Peter Parkers out there, congratulations. Coming up. Desperation and anger in Mexico tonight after deadly Hurricane Otis. Why people there say they are not getting the help they so very much need. Next. To the latest on the devastating scene down in Acapulco, Mexico, after Hurricane Otis. Remember that hurricane that went from basically a tropical storm to a monster practically overnight? with people picking up the pieces after the Cat 5 storm hit. But with no power and with streets flooded, getting help to the people who need it has been incredibly difficult. Here's Guadvenegas. Sleek beachfront hotels in Acapulco now in ruins after Hurricane Otis ravaged the area. We are living in a very difficult situation and help has not arrived. It's the strongest storm ever to make landfall on Mexico's Pacific coast and the popular tourist destination, home to nearly a million people now struggling to recover. The death toll jumping to 45 people, according to the state's governor, with dozens more still missing. Military officials saying dozens of boats sank and still more washed up on the shore. The marina completely devastated. We tried to save the boats, but with these winds, we were unable to save any of them. They were big yachts, about 80 feet. They all disappeared. Now, frustration with the government's response growing as residents say they're left to fend for themselves. Many flocking to makeshift shelters, lining up for hours for a chance to get food and water. 
The government should help us with food. I only see that they are just patrolling. They should bring food and water. Stores looted out of desperation for basic necessities. This woman pleading for help from the international community. We don't have anything anymore. They looted everything. Not all of us looted. We really need help. There's nobody here. The government saying 6,500 soldiers are working to keep the peace and help with the aid. Otis's rapid transition from a tropical storm to a Category 5 hurricane happened in just 12 hours, leaving Acapulco residents with little time to prepare. Winds gusting up to 165 miles per hour. The Mexican president detailing that not a single power line remains standing in the affected areas. Helicopters. This morning, telling the country helicopters are being used to bring in new utility poles and get the power running as soon as possible, with the president also announcing a tanker carrying gasoline has arrived to help with the fuel shortage. But that will be just another early step in a long rebuilding process, with the cost of the destruction potentially reaching $15 billion. Just as this community's core tourist season approaches, the Mexican Hotel Association telling the Associated Press 80% of the hotels in the area have been damaged. Guad is joining us now. It's it's horrific to think about this, Guad, and to see the damage here, to think about not a, pow not a single power line still standing, right? The airport was damaged too. So for a long time, the only way in and out since this storm hit was by a highway that was still getting fixed because of the damage, right? So where do things stand now with people being able to access not just the road, that highway, but being able to get on a plane if they needed to? Hallie, and this is also because of where it's located. Acapulco is on the coast, surrounded by mountains. So that highway was the only way in and out for a few days. A lot of the tourists initially had to get bussed out. So uh, federal efforts have been on getting that airport repaired, both the terminal and the control tower. Now, as of this morning, uh, the press conference held by the president announced that the repairs have been made. Uh, they have been getting some commercial flights in and out during the day to evacuate a lot of the tourists. So when they say all of of them have been evacuated and they expect everything to be back to normal at the airport by Wednesday, even with night flights, because they'll have all the power. And just today, they expect six commercial flights. So good news as things go back to normal uh, at the airport, Hallie. Yeah, a bit of a glimmer of hope there. Guad Venegas, thank you very much for that reporting. Still to come here on the show for the first time ever, the DOJ is taking two airlines to court over potential merger. Why they say it could end up costing you more money to fly coming up. For the first time ever, federal regulators are heading to court to try to stop a merger between two airlines to try to keep the number of airlines from shrinking. You know, there's really only four big companies that dominate the travel market here in this country, American, Delta, Southwest, United. Well, now the Justice Department says a potential merger between JetBlue and Spirit could mean not as many flights flying, not as many options for people, especially people who are looking to save some money. Now, JetBlue says, wait a second, no, no, this merger will actually increase competition because it would create one big national low fare challenger to those dominant big four airlines and create a strong fifth player in the market. A trial is set to start tomorrow in U.S. District Court in Boston. Leslie Josephs is joining us now. Leslie, we're glad to have you here. So walk us through some of the enforcement here. The DOJ has challenged some other airline mergers. I'm thinking of American and U.S. Airways back in 2013. That case was settled before trial. Talk us through the situation here and the differences. Well, some of the differences starting, the Biden Justice Department has been very aggressive on the antitrust front. They have gone after a lot of combinations with mixed results, um, but they are not backing down, especially with airlines. The Biden administration has also been very vocal about everything from fees to, you know, costs to sit with your family with airlines. So it, it does kind of have a, a special place uh, within the administration. They are being aggressive about it. Um, this is a little bit different than U.S. Airways and American a decade ago or even Virgin uh, America and Alaska in 2016, uh, you know, this is, Spirit is a budget airline. It's known for sometimes it's single digit or double digit fares. JetBlue is more of a full service carrier. But the JetBlue's argument is that they need to merge with Spirit in order to compete with the big four that uh, control most of the U.S. market, about 80% of, of the flights that we fly on. 
Leslie, let me channel what I think a lot of viewers would be wondering, which is, okay, so what does it mean for me, right? In other words, what does this mean for the money that I pay to try to fly if I don't want to spend a lot? Is it going to be good for customers, bad for customers, or is that what's at question here? Well, JetBlue's argument is that a bigger JetBlue can compete with the airlines that really control a lot of these uh, airports. If you've flown out of Newark or Dallas or Atlanta, you know who is controlling uh, the majority of those, those flights. Um, it does remain to be seen, but, you know, JetBlue is going to be taking out a low-cost airline from the market. You know, this is one that, that does offer rock-bottom fares, and is it a little bit of a different market than and product of what JetBlue offers? Um, so, you know, with the, with consolidation, there are often you know you cut flights that are there are too much. There's too much overlap. Airlines' goal is still to make money, um, so that is going to be an issue going forward. Um, but JetBlue says that this you know a bigger JetBlue with Spirit combined is going to put more pressure on the big players, the Deltas, Americans, and Uniteds of the world, to lower their fares also. Leslie Josephs, thank you very much. We'll see how that one goes as it starts tomorrow. Appreciate it. Thank you. That does it for us for this hour. We've got more coverage picking up right now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.